My name is Ilona Posner. I'm a user experience and a usability consultant. And I was asked to come and talk about user experience design with um, uh, the startups and other uh, participants in this program. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I've just given you a little bit of background of what it is that I do, what, where I come from. My background is computer science, but I very early on discovered that I didn't like programming and that I realized that actually the front door was the more important part. If we don't get the interface right, the rest of the program doesn't matter at all. I realized that there was a lot of important work to be done in the interfaces in the front end. It was called human computer interaction at the time. And so I continued on. I did a lot of um, consulting and teaching, sort of balanced, uh, and I still do that. I do a lot of training courses in corporations and across all kinds of industries. I enjoy the breadth and variety that my work brings. I have never done the same project twice. so. It's always fun and exciting and always unknown. And I want to talk to you today about user experience in general. What is it? How do we consider that in all the different work that we do? In my mind, uh, prototyping is all about testing with users. That's why we do it, so we can get feedback as soon as possible. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to design some prototypes and then test them. This is the view of the world. It's all about the points of view. We have a certain point of view. As we come, we all have points of view, limited points of view. And everybody else has a different one. And so Alan Kay, who is the guy who invented uh, digital uh, books in 1968, and he was, uh, Dynabook was his project. Um, he invented Windows, among other things. He, he received the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel for computer science. This is his quote, a point of view is worth 80 points of IQ. So we each have a limited number of points of view. And so how do we get the other points of view? We have to go out and find them. And the more points of view we can bring to our projects and our work, the better it will be. And this is one most important things is you are not the user. If you're working on the project, if you know anything about the project, if you've talked about the project, brainstormed on it, you are not the user. You know too much. And your point of view is no longer virgin, no longer the same as anybody who's coming in from the outside. And so if you're designing for yourself, great, but if you're probably not, so how do we make that work for somebody who's not you? And this is a metaphor that I, I like and I'm going to write a book about. It's called Keyhole Impact. This is the, the view we have on the world. We see the world with a very narrow, through a keyhole through our keyhole. So we, our brain gets about 40 million signals at all times, at every second, and we can only process about 30. And so the rest of them fall aside and we ignore. We have to ignore, otherwise we would be overwhelmed and we couldn't function. So if I tell you, uh, you probably weren't thinking about how your clothes was feeling on your body, right, until now. Now you feel those signals that your clothes are sending to your body, your skin, you're getting more sensitive to that, right? That's one of the 30. That's one of the 30 right now. But something else has fallen off, right? Maybe you can't hear what's going on in the hall. Maybe you can't notice the, the change in, in, the, in the lighting outside as the clouds come and go, right? Maybe you can't see what these people are doing in the corner, but now you know, you're paying attention to my hand because I'm waving at you. So those 30, the limit is very small, and so the point is we got to focus somewhere, like an, you're in a party, somebody says your name, you hear it, something else has to go. And so how do we get the right information to the people that we're trying to design for at the right time so that, you know, oh, it's in the manual, nobody's ever going to read the manual, right? It's on, oh, it's in the page, well, nobody, the more we know, the more we put on the page, the less they're going to read. So how do we get the right stuff to the right person at the right time? And again, I am not the user. This is the mantra that, that I always get all my students and all my, all my residents to, to chant with me because the sooner you understand that and believe that, the further and faster you're going to improve your products. And this is one example. You've all seen this, right? How many of you have seen the arrow in the FedEx sign? Raise your hand. Okay, and the rest of you are looking at this going, there's an arrow in the FedEx sign? Keep looking at it. Okay, keep looking at it. How many of you have not seen the arrow yet? Please, raise your hand. Raise your hand and keep looking at it. Okay, so here's the arrow. 
<laughs> now you have all seen the arrow. You, have ne you are never going to be able to not see it again. It was always here and now you are no longer the user, right? You are no longer able to not see it. And this is a little example of the points of view that I'm talking about. The button's on the page. Where on the page? What are you talking about? How often do you get that? Okay. Exactly. Let's talk about user experience and the history of that. It's evolved since, well, around late 40s. At around, at the end of the war, it became obvious that um, if the button on the plane, say for the eject button, is next to the bomb button, and if the pilot pushes the wrong button, it's a very expensive mistake, right? And so at that point, a lot more resources were put into saving that wrong button push and preventing that airplane from, you know, falling in the lake. That was how many millions of dollars. And so that was the first focus. That was the area of human factors and ergonomics is where it was started on designing cockpits and, and control panels to reduce errors and uh, in terms of pilots and space. But you know what? The difference here is these users are very highly trained. So you could put buttons in weird places and they would still tolerate it and they managed it up until then. And we could talk again about design of cockpits and, and some of the instruments in there. And that whole space again is really rich and very challenging. And then we jump into the 50s where we have, you know, new potential for technology. And does anybody know what this is? It's a touchpad. It's a very big touchpad from the 50s, okay? So here's a man putting these things into a storage. This is memory, computer memory, okay? Each of those is a bit. Yeah. And this is the user. Here's the user. He has control panels, almost like a cockpit in an airplane. And he's operating on this really low resolution, tiny monocolored uh, display. But he is the guy who's programming. He's probably the guy who built it. So again, the range of user, to, and there was not that many of them. And again, they could tolerate a lot of training, so it was okay. Now we jump to the 80s, the first personal computer. In this day, um, anybody who had to work in an office was, had to start dealing with these kind of devices. It took one week to learn Microsoft Word. You had to go to a course for one week to learn Microsoft Word. You remember, right? You're laughing. Because you probably had to take that course. I know. Word star. Word star. Yeah. And so now we jump again and we're here, right? It's everywhere. It's, and have we gone from like one week to how many new apps did you have to get this week, right? Yeah. And learn and, and start using at an expert level without anybody giving you any kind of feedback. Is our design that much better now? Have we reached that? Are we that great? We hope. How do we become that great? So that's hopefully the part of the focus of my conversation today.